I need you to stand up. Everybody stand up. Come on. Last speaker, you owe it to yourself. Stand up. Now, bounce around while I uh, turn it around. Bounce, turn around, bounce, 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 turn around. Somebody count to 10 while I'm doing this. One, two, keep going. Excellent. All right, you can all sit down. Thank you very much. No matter what I do, no matter what I say over the next 10 minutes, it won't be as ridiculous as what you guys just did. Okay. I actually do say wow. I, I have four adult children, 26, 24, 23, 18, going on 35. I can say that because she's not here. None of you know her, so I can't be possibly be penalized or held at ransom for any of you. I am a headhunter. Everybody know what a head, anybody know what a headhunter is? Show of hands. Oh, the adults in the room do. Yes, of course you do. Here's what I do for a living, and this is what I've done for 30 years. I travel all over the world interviewing people for companies. That's all I do. Uh, we took a guess with the last book. Uh, I think I have now interviewed 70,000 people. I've read probably 500,000 resumes or LinkedIn profiles, give or take maybe 10,000. That's a lot. I've negotiated $300 million in deals. That means someone got paid $20,000 or $100,000. It all gets tucked up into that $300 million. It's a lot of experience. And I can boil your success down to your doing three things, which is why I wrote them on the board. And I'm hoping some of you will write them down. Because a Harvard study not more than four or five years ago found that people that actually wrote down their goals, you write your goals. Now, when they interview you 20 years from now, here's the incentive, ready? You will, have, you will be making 97 times more than any of your friends in this room who wrote no goals down. So I'm hoping that's enough of an incentive to get you to do some of this stuff today. So, three secrets. Three secrets to finding a great job, having a super life. Today I'm talking about your future. In your future, and taking charge of it can come down to three things. Do what you love, invest in yourself, that means understanding your value, and I can't spell worth a crap today. I try, I'm supposed to say advice. What I mean by that is be very careful who you take advice from. So let's talk about the first one. I have four um, adult children, as I, as I said. And I said to them, what do you want to do in life? And, I, and I've been doing this for 10 or 15 years with all of them. What do you want to do in life? And you know what? Um, I don't think, and my wife's up, up there looking at me, I don't think any of them really know yet. How many people in this room know what you're going to do in life when you get out of college or university? Show of hands. Thank you. That's not unusual. I was one of those people had no clue, seriously. Went to McGill, just wanted to get out. High school, just wanted to graduate. Just wanted to graduate. Went to university, just wanted to graduate. Because back in the 80s, I mean, we're talking like dinosaurs roamed the earth, the whole nine yards, right? Spam, spam was canned meat you might get for lunch. Okay, only, ad only the adults can relate to that, okay? But that's what spam was. It was a delicacy. Back in the 80s, you, when you got out, or, or even oh, farther back than that, when you got out of school, you were going to take a job that you were probably going to keep for the rest of your life. That's a huge decision. Back then, it was, it, just, it kept me up a lot. Not the same thing now. Life, the life for you guys is so much better. You, you have no idea what you're capable of doing. You know these people, your, your parents have probably told you all your life, you can be anything you want to be, you can do anything you want to do. Has anybody heard that before? Hopefully, yes, you know, great parents. My parents told me that as well. They also talked to me about the Easter Bunny, Santa Claus, and the Tooth Fairy. Liars. However, now, at this point in time of the world, 
with all the technology that we have, the fact that we're all so connected together, you actually can do anything you want and be anything you want to be. Got to put a little bit of work into it. This is the question for the girls because the guys usually don't know this stuff. How many people know of uh, or watch uh, Superwoman? Okay, right? There's an example of someone who decided early in life that she wanted to make something out of herself. How many people don't know who Superwoman are? Show of hands. Okay, well, we're going to have to, we're going to, have to address you two in the back later. Okay. She's a typical example. She could not have possibly done what she'd done 10 years ago, even five years ago. But she decided she wanted to do something. So let's talk about this now. What do you, what do you love doing? What can you do that you love that you want to turn into a job? Or not even a job, work. And if you don't know, that's OK. Because you're only, what, grade 11, grade 12? I'm 56, OK? Most people that are my age, remember 70,000 people I've interviewed, most people that are my age are only starting to figure out who they are and what they want to be now. Some people go through it in their 40s. We call it midlife you know, crisis, right? Maybe their 50s. It's a midlife crisis. They wake up and realize, oh, I don't want to be a tax accountant anymore. I want to be a ballerina. OK, good. Might not, might not have the legs to do it anymore. But you're in an advantage right now because you can decide now what you want to do for the rest of your life. And you can change your mind over and over and over again. When I got out of school, you chose a job for life. And, and if you change jobs, you are considered a job hopper. And, and all the adults here know what I'm talking about. If you actually had three jobs in your lifetime, you were unstable. Now, you're likely to have 20 jobs in the first 10 years you get out of university. 20. The world of work has changed. Or the world of work has changed that much. So how many people know what they want to do? Show of hands. How many people would like to figure out what they want to do? Show of hands. Ah, oh, this is interesting. So what are you doing? I'll tell you what my children are doing. My children, my adult children are doing. My daughter, 20 years old, came back from U, U, U Quam? What, what's it called? Uh, it, was a, you know, it was a division of the University of Toronto. I, I can't remember what it's called right now. And she said to me, she said, Dad, you know, I, I, I just can't stay here anymore. I, I'm running out of money. She spent all mine and all hers. I'm running out of money, and I'm really bored, and I don't think this is what I want to do. And I said, well, you know, what do you want to do? She says, I don't know. I said, well, you know what? Take some time. I would rather you take some time now to see what's really interesting than you hit 50 and go, oh my god, I didn't want to be a tax accountant. But a decision you made you know, 30 years ago has now got you stuck. So what do you do instead? You go and talk to people. Go and talk to other people, find out what they do, find out why they like their jobs. Or do what my, my daughter did. She said, I I'm going to become a yoga instructor. I said, that's a great idea. I said, but like, doesn't that take like two years of college or whatever? She said, no, no, I met this woman uh, tonight uh, at the yoga studio. And uh, she went to India. And she got her teaching certificate as a yoga instructor. I'm thinking, yeah, OK, we're it's Ottawa, right? I mean, it's a long ways away. I'm thinking, OK, that's great, because she's 20 years old. And at that time, as a father, I'm, I'm listening more than I'm talking. And, and the adults will know what I'm talking about. I'm just listening. And uh, five weeks later, I'm waving goodbye to my daughter, because she came home, went on 14 job interviews. Sorry, applied to 14 jobs, got 13 job interviews, took 12 jobs, took 12 jobs, kept four of them, saved enough money to buy a ticket to India and check herself into an ashram. And she went and became a yoga instructor. And she comes back to Canada. And I said, well, like, why did you do that? She said, well, I, you know, I, I can't stand working at Starbucks anymore. And, and I have another daughter that works at Starbucks, and I love Starbucks. But she said, at $10 an hour, I'm never going to get anywhere. If I go and become a yoga instructor, I can put 10 people in a room for $10 an hour. I'm now I'm making $100. So, OK, she's starting to, starting to think. So she started to invest in herself. So here's what happens. She goes away. She comes back. She decides, oh, you know, that was interesting, but I'm not really sure that's what I want to do. I said, so what are you going to do next? She said, well, you know, I'm, I'm doing this stuff with Canada World Youth. So my daughter, who's now 26, by the time she was 24, had been to the Ukraine, to, to, the, to Peru, the Ukraine, India, Nepal, 
Costa Rica, Nicaragua, and Guatemala. Not everything that you're going to use in a job, you're going to learn in school. Not everything that you want to use on the job, you're going to learn on the job. My daughter decided when she was 23 that she was going to go to um, Central America and teach flash yoga. It's not obscene. It's, it, you just randomly teach yoga to, to strangers. And I said, like, what are you, crazy? I said, how are you going to do that? She said, well, I'm going to do a, a fundraising campaign on the web through Kickstarter or, or uh, GoDaddy, one of these places, and raise enough money. And people are going to get to come. People are going to have the privilege of watching me through my boyfriend. You have a boyfriend? My boyfriend's camera as we go across Middle America or Central America, taking pictures of me in yoga poses, teaching strangers yoga. And that's what she did. Next thing you know, she's landing in Panama, goes to Nicaragua, Guatemala, Costa Rica, teaching random strangers yoga. How does that possibly help you with a job? Well, she comes back, right? And what does she learn? She learned how to create a project, execute a project, do a fundraiser, budget, marketing, the whole nine yards. So when she decided she wanted to get a job, all these new skills that she'd learned, she had learned while not in school, but out in the real world while she was trying to figure out what she was doing. So if you don't know what you want to do, ah, it's not the end of the world. Take all that pressure away until you get out of college or university. I'm just kidding. Take all that pressure away and try a whole bunch of new things. That's principle number one. If you want to, if you want to have a great life, you have, to, you have to start on the right foot. And the right foot is not necessarily the right job. It's understanding what you want to do. Understanding what you want to do. And if, you're, if what you want to do happens to be your passion, it's really easy. The money, if you've heard the expression, you know, do what you love, the money will follow. It's not a theory. It's reality. It is reality. So the second um, thing to remember is invest in yourself. And here's what I mean by invest in yourself. Yes, it's good that you go and take courses and that you do all that kind of stuff, but that's not the kind of investing I'm talking about. The kind of investing I'm talking about is when you go to work someplace, this is where I get in trouble when I, when I speak. When you go to work at some place, go to work where they, at a place where they respect you. And if they don't respect you, keep moving. In the old days, if you went to an employer and it didn't work out and you went somewhere else, that was a black stroke against your record. They considered you a job hopper. Like I said, three jobs, you're unemployable. Nowadays, doesn't happen. Go to a place where they respect you and they're going to invest in you. And take a look at every step that you make when you're out in the working world as a little mini project. And decide ahead of time, am I going to learn something by going to this organization? What am I going to learn? And stay at that place and work and give it your all, but only as long as you're learning something and they're respecting you. That's investing in yourself. And it's a lot like being a. Um, we just watched the Olympics, right? These people, these Olympic athletes have been investing in themselves for years, often decades, to get to the final game. You should treat yourself the same way. Become an Olympic athlete in whatever it is you want to do. And invest in yourself and get better and better and better and better. And every place you go, you learn something new and you up your value. You learn new skills as a programmer or a project manager or whatever you happen to choose. But invest in yourself. And you, you can never go wrong investing in yourself. And the last one is advice. Be very careful who you accept advice from. I mean, I'm giving you advice. What do I know? Do I know enough? I've tried to convince you that you should actually be listening to me. But you need to decide who you're going to accept advice from. Because everyone in your life is going to have an opinion. It's like, have any, a show of hands, anyone written a resume lately? Anyone written a resume that everybody absolutely loved the first time they read it? Yeah, right. Because everybody's got an opinion, right? So, and there's no right answer. But you have to figure out who the people are in your life who are really interested and concerned about your well-being. And those are the people that you listen to. Because everybody has an opinion. 
And I won't make that joke. Thank you very much, adults. I won't make that joke. Everybody has an opinion. And let me give you an example. I had a massive stroke in 2008. I could not walk, talk, read, or write. I started to talk again on the morning of the fifth day. Let's put, set that aside. In the hospital bed, I could hear everything that was going on, and I understood every, every, every single word. I just couldn't communicate, because my mouth wasn't working, because that part of the brain got disconnected. And I listened to the doctor as he put his arm around my wife a couple of hours after I've had this, uh, this stroke, and pulls her in, and he says, brace yourself. He may stay in that vegetated state for the rest of his life. Uh, she didn't believe it, I didn't believe it, and I started talking again on the fifth day. If I had believed them, maybe I wouldn't have. If I had done what they told me to do, and these were experts, if I had done what they had told me to do, which was go home, take a year and a half, two years off, and you'll recover. I can tell you right now, because the studies have been done since I had the, the stroke, that your brain is like any other muscle. If you don't use it, you lose it. So if I'd gone home and I just, you know, watched television, um, I probably wouldn't be here having this conversation today. But the reason I didn't, the reason I didn't, it's not because I'm automatically skeptical of everyone who ever tells me anything. No, honestly, I'm not. What it was was something deep inside me said, you know what? He's wrong. And every single one of you has the ability, innate, and the innate ability to understand when something is right, you feel it in your gut. When something is wrong, you feel it in your gut. And people will tell you, it has to be rational, it has to be logical. And I'm telling you, that's not true. If you feel like something is right or wrong, follow your gut. And if you do these things, if you do what you love, if you invest in yourself, if you watch who gives you advice and what you take in and what you keep, you can do anything you want. And my kids are examples of this. I have three daughters. They're all warrior women. These women are out changing the world. My middle daughter you know, decided that she wasn't sure she wanted to do north-south studies. You know, she wants to end up in Africa uh, doing a whole bunch of different stuff. And she said, you know what? I should probably visit some of these places before I make this decision. But no one in her class was doing that. So my daughter decided that ah, she'd take off to Malaysia. So with a little satellite dish you know, on, her, on her side so I could tell where she was, she took off to Malaysia. My, my youngest daughter is going to be an actress. And we're sitting at the dining room table I don't know, a year ago, and my daughter, said, who's 17 at the time, says to my, my father, so her grandfather, he says, well, what are you going to do, Shannon, now that you've gotten out of uh, high school? She says, well, I'm going to go to Algonquin. I'm going to be an actress. And his immediate reaction was, an actress? What are you, what are you going to do with an acting degree? And as she sat there trying to figure out what she was going to say to this old man who you know, she used to look up to until about three seconds ago, I leaned over and I said, Dad, anything she wants. Have you any idea what you can do with an acting degree? And I answered the question. And she'll, she'll probably won't ask her grandfather anymore what she, uh, for his opinion. My son, going to McGill University. I mean, I mean, roll back 20 years. He's 24, uh, so not 20 years. I remember sitting in grade two. He's going into grade two. And I'm there with my wife. And we were there with the school, um, the, the principal, and the guidance counselor, the social worker, whatever her title was at the time. And uh, they come, they've asked us to this meeting because my son's a problem. He's slow. We know he's slow. We've been told he's slow. But we had him tested because uh, we weren't sure they were right. So we had him tested. He's not slow. So anyway, they, we sit down and they're about to say, they're, they're trying to work up the, the, uh, the courage to use the word retarded. 
and tell us that our son is retarded. And they're really struggling for a couple of minutes trying to use this term. And I said, forget it. Listen, here, you read this report, you read this report. There were two psychologist reports, who, both of whom I happen to respect. You're not retarded. He's bored. He's got an IQ of 186. In grade two, he, can, he, could, he, could, he could read and write fairly well and do math, addition, subtraction, division, multiplication. In grade one, he wasn't retarded. He was just bored spitless. But if we had believed what the experts were about to tell us, he probably might be not in McGill right now in engineering. So what do we learn today? We learned that you can do anything you want. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you quite sincerely, after having interviewed 70,000 people, there has never been a better time in the world, and frankly, there's never been a better place to be in in the world, than right here, right now, with all the technology that you have at your, at your disposal to make things happen like this. You're all connected. When we talk as a generation, when we talk about you being you know, the great generation that's coming, we're not kidding because we know what we didn't have as tools. We know what you have as tools. You just have to decide to use them because the future is in your hands.